Hello everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time visiting and you enjoy what you are hearing, please don't forget to become best friends with the subscribe button and also the little tag along, the bell. Set that one to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes or would like to tip me with a coffee, all of that information can be found down below as well. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Lost in the Woods Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Hey folks, I'm kind of new and this is my first story ever telling to someone, so let's get started. I must clarify, this didn't happen only to me, but my uncle too. This was after a Christmas Eve party where everyone went home. I decided to stay because my cousin and I were watching a movie. My uncle, who used to walk his dogs into the woods next to a park, went off to take them out. Before this, my aunt told him to don't do that because it was too dark out there. It was around like 4 or 5 a.m. He didn't care that much and he went off anyway. My aunt was so worried so I went along with him. Once there, anything wrong seemed to happen. Everything got quiet. My uncle and his dogs were having a relaxing walk, as usual, and I wasn't really paying attention to the surroundings when suddenly the dogs went silent. This wasn't that strange. They always stopped their way back to stare and bark to other animals they noticed like rats, birds, insects, or other dogs, etc. However, this time was different. When the dogs got still, my uncle and I noticed something was going on, and very wrong. The dogs weren't angry or curious. They were just kind of nervous, anxious, and afraid. One of the dogs, the largest one, was growling and shaking. As my uncle started to get worried about the situation, we heard it. People in the woods. We didn't see how many because of the darkness. They were saying something. We gather here by the blood of incomprehensible. We incomprehensible. The and my incomprehensible. As my uncle and I heard that, he yelled for his dogs to follow him out of the woods. As we all left too, he turned his head back, and he only saw a slight movement of branches and shrubs, perhaps because these people were trying to hide. After all that happened, he hasn't walked his dogs near those woods, nor when it gets dark, neither. So, to the strangers in the woods, let's not ever meet again. Back when I was a kid, around 10 or 11, my house was on the end of a low-traffic neighborhood road that ran up against a large forest. I used to play games, run around, and go for walks with my friends behind my house. Of all forests and woodsy areas I've seen, this one seemed to be the most dense. And I do mean, some parts of the forest were so close together that you could barely walk next to a friend without having to constantly move behind them or in front of them to pass between two trees. Anyway, it was a regular Friday night, so I invited my best friend over since there was no school tomorrow. By the time he came over, the sun was beginning to set. Still, we wanted to hang out in the woods before it got too dark. For extra security, we grabbed some heavy flashlights and headed for the trees. After walking for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, we found a fallen tree on which we sat and just talked. 
It was one of our favorite things to do, just sit in the woods and talk about whatever we felt like. I'm not sure how long we sat there, but we definitely got lost in the conversation because when I finally looked up, the forest was almost completely dark, and I think we were lost. Initially, neither of us was too scared since we knew our way back around the forest, but we just thought we'd head back before it got pitch black. We turned on our flashlights and started walking. I will admit, though, I was definitely a little creeped out. It was almost completely silent, except for the crunch of leaves from our steps, and we could only see a few feet ahead of us because the dense trees blocked the view. Two or three minutes after we started walking, we both heard the distant sound of someone walking slowly across the leaves just ahead of us. They must have been behind some trees just 50 to 20 feet from where we were. Honestly, I couldn't help but wonder why would anyone go for a walk alone in the woods at this time of night without a light? While I tried to stay calm, just as we thought the person was getting further away, the footsteps stopped. My friend and I both froze. The two of us looked at each other in fear and confusion. It felt like everything had gone silent all at once. As I stood there looking at my friend, I had a rush go through my body with the feeling that I was in immediate danger. Almost a split second later, I heard leaves crunching behind us. My instincts kicked in. I took off running straight in the direction of my house. As I ran, my shoulders constantly bumped into the trees as it was hard to navigate through them with barely any light. I heard footsteps crunching the leaves behind me. The only thing I could do was hope it was my friend, but I was too scared to look back. After 30 seconds of running, I heard the footsteps turn sharply to the right and drift off into the distance. This made me even more terrified that those footsteps weren't my friends, and I wondered where my friend actually was and if he was okay. I finally managed to get to my backyard and went straight into my house through the back door. I was out of breath. I peeked through the windows to see if my friend showed up, but after a few minutes, I started getting worried. My parents came downstairs and asked if I was okay as they saw the panicked look on my face. Just as I was telling them everything, our front doorbell rang. My dad nervously cracked open the door. The door flew open and my friend ran inside. Apparently, after I ran, he froze in place, not knowing what to do, not knowing where to go, as he was lost. He heard two sets of footprints go after me, and after a few moments, he decided to run towards my house as well. My parents called the police and reported the incident, but nothing ever came of it. I still talk about it with my friend, coming up with new theories about what really happened that night. Although I wish I could look back to see who was chasing me. I know in a forest like that, I wouldn't have gotten five steps before running straight into a tree. In that case, that's still the most terrifying experience I have ever had, and since then, I always get uneasy when I'm around the forest at night. Years ago, man, I'm old. And let's just say it was the mid-1990s. I worked as a woodland firefighter while in the Army Reserves. I worked as a spotter. Basically, I was stationed in a giant fire tower in the middle of a national park. My job was just as it sounds. I used binoculars to look out for fire, smoke, and other telltale signs of fire. My nearest compadre was five miles or so from us. My days consisted of working my shift, taking long walks around the fire tower, being on the lookout for anyone who might be having illegal fires going on, 
looking out for wildlife and staying afoot of bears and wolves. The way our shifts worked back then was one week on and one week off. So we slept in the towers, cooked our food, etc. There were nearby toilets and showers if we needed them. One day, I came across an illegal bear trap. I had several ranger friends and I safely set off the trap and picked it up to take to the ranger station on one of my treks out for food in my jeep. Poaching is illegal in the park and carried a big fine back then and jail time, but I did not stop the poachers from trying. I heard rifle shots and headed back to my fire tower. We did have a rifle in the tower to be used just in case of emergencies. Just a few months back, a fellow spotter had been mauled to death by a grizzly, so each tower had been outfitted with a rifle. I looked with my binoculars, but did not see anything out of the ordinary. I radioed my co-worker, Ben, an older guy in the adjacent tower. He hadn't heard anything today, but had come across a few traps himself. That night, after a dinner of frank and beans and toast, I was writing to my future wife when I heard the rumbling of a truck. Thinking it may be Ben, occasionally he made the trek over. We would crack open a soda and chew the fat for a bit. Instead, I saw four men with rifles get out of the truck. One looked around and leaned up against the truck while the other three grabbed traps and began to set them up. I grabbed the rifle and my lantern and headed down the stairs. I was only 21, a farmer's son from a rural Virginia farming town, and even with one deployment behind me, I was naive. I should have called it in to the rangers, but instead I thought I could talk some sense into four dangerous men. I barely got a, hey, how you doing, out of my mouth before I was roughly shoved by rough hands. My lantern fell and I heard it crack. The rifle was kicked away from me and I felt the breath leave my chest when I was violently kicked in my stomach. I barely had caught my breath when I was grabbed by two of the men and was shoved forward into the woods. It seemed like we walked for miles, but in reality, it was probably only a mile. However, I noticed that there were no sounds in the forest. It is rarely silent. It's a cacophony of sounds, even at night. Owls, the wolves, crickets, but on this night, nothing. Suddenly, I was shoved to my knees and I felt hot tears well up. I thought of my parents, my little sister and brother, and my fiancé who were back home in Virginia. I heard the rack of a gun and I shut my eyes and prayed. Suddenly, the night erupted. However, it was the sound of sirens, those of the forest rangers, and behind them, in his pickup truck, Ben, who had tried to radio me that he had heard car engines and came to my tower when I didn't reply. The poachers were arrested. Ben drove me back to the tower. I was still shaking. He didn't lay into me for not following procedure. He just said, that was close, kiddo. I ended up leaving the job months later to take a job closer to home, but I never ran into any more poachers during the rest of my time. I kept in contact with Ben for a while, sent him a wedding invite, and then a photo of my firstborn son in 1997. However, as time usually does, we lost track of one another, and a few years back, I googled him. He would have been 75 or so to discover he passed away a few years back. I don't know whatever came of those poachers, but I know I never want to meet them again. Disclaimer, this next story does involve the killing of animals in the forest. If this is not your cup of tea, listening discretion is highly advised. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that has ever happened to me. I have never been so petrified in my life. To this day, 
I still do not know who this man was, what he was trying to do, or if he is still where I saw him last. I'm sorry for how long the geographical description is. I just want everyone to understand how secluded I was when this happened and how badly it could have ended if it wasn't for my parents. I was back home for the summer for the first time in a year after starting uni. Our home was, still is, just outside of a small town with forests all around. There was also a small man-made lake, which was diverged from a river that ran for miles around the forest and ramified into a few streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk, but one I used to go on often as a child. I knew the forests there well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would go on always led me off the path, which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream, and then took a sharp turn to the west after a few miles, walking, at which point the stream was hidden quite deep into the forest. I'd continued to walk north and follow the stream through the forest to go to the river, then follow the river west into the lake. It's easy to get lost in this forest because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water. It goes up and down and you end up completely surrounded by trees. I've spent many days wandering there alone or with my dad over the span of 18 years. Never saw anybody else in the forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone-ish. The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path away from the stream to the sharp bend that cut back into the forest. I reached the stream after an hour or so, as I was running my hands in the water. I heard a bell from far away, coming from the north. Something was making a bell ring, fervently and periodically, which I found strange. I listened well wondered if it was a lost hunting dog or started moving towards the sound. I bloody know I'd be the first person to die, but I was heading north anyway, so what the hell? I realized it couldn't have been an animal. I could tell the bell was too heavy because of how clear the sound was to be on a collar. I kept moving, and the bell was moving away from me. It stopped completely after five minutes. The stream wasn't big enough or strong enough to carry a bell that could have been enclosed in a tin or something, and the river was too far still. I thought of everything, but nothing explained the sound apart from one obvious thing, which I just didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to have been a person. I stopped thinking about it and just walked on normally until I found a badger, a bloomin' dead one, carefully decapitated. It had obviously been done with a knife. It was fairly fresh. The body was still limp, and there wasn't too much smell coming from it. The wound was full of maggots, and I knew that happened soon after exposure. The sound of that bell had been following the stream. So had I. So, the badger was put there maybe killed there, at least decapitated, while I was walking that way, I suppose. I don't really know. Nothing else happened that day. One week later, I went back for the second time that summer, and the last time ever. I left home at around 6 p.m. I made it to the stream, then walked to the river in an hour, then decided to go back the way I had came because it was getting late and it was raining quite heavily. The sun set at around 9 p.m. I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain in the trees was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while, though, the clearest and most open part of the forest, when I happened to bump into something heavy. The smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger, 
with his head strung to his front paws. That area looked a bit like a ham because of the way it was tied, just swinging from a tree like an almost literal load of bollocks. It was this putrid bag of stench, wet and dripping green liquid. I started gagging. I had some sort of mucus textured fluid in my hair. It was repulsive. At first, I just stared at it, slightly gobsmacked. Then I started fidgeting violently because I felt like I was drenched in its juices. I was soaking from the rain. My senses became confused. It felt like a bucket of ice cold water had been thrown over me when I realized that I walked the same way to get to the river, so someone had strung up the body. After I had passed it on the way there, someone knew I'd seen it, so was someone watching me and running around the forest? Were the faint sounds of branches breaking around me not animals? I looked around and started jogging. I was halfway running, halfway walking, away from the stream, back towards the path for a while, when I heard the bell again. I proceeded to call my dad while running. I told him to meet me on the path where it sharply turns west. It was the closest part of the path to me to go as fast as he could and that someone was in the forest. I can't explain the feeling I had. It was like I had just shit out my intestines and stomach. I literally felt the hairs on my neck raise despite being soaked. It was dark. I jogged as fast as I could. I was panicked because the path was still a bit far away, just too far to feel safe. It was still raining. Every single sound was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than before. The bell went on for way longer than the last time, on and off. I felt like it was surrounding me at one point. The fear combined with my compromised hearing and the fact that I couldn't flip and breathe properly was making me slightly lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't really sure what I was even doing. I was breathing like a goddamn horse, coughing my lungs up, kind of crying out loud like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mom, who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing sounds, but I wasn't sure where they were or what they were. My mom was screaming on the phone at the same time that they were on the path, that I needed to run, that my dad had gotten out and he was heading east from the path bend. I was terrified, so I went straight into survival mode. I was doing the half run, half speed walking thing again because I was out of breath. Then I heard branches break, clear footsteps for the first time from down in the forest and the bell ringing louder. I didn't want to, but I looked over my shoulder. That's when I saw what was in the forest with me a tall figure creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing, ringing his bell slowly in front of his stomach. I could not tell he was staring straight at me. Now, I don't know if I had a hidden secret sprinting agility or instinctual adrenaline-induced superhuman powers, but I'm here to tell you, I ran for my fucking life while also fucking looking back to make sure this thing was not following me anymore. I screamed as much as I could. I'm on the phone with the police. They are on the path. Dad, I can see you. I'm over here. I wanted to yell. Dad, please. Where are you? But I kept that to myself. I felt like something awful was going to happen. I felt like that man was right behind me. I kept telling myself not to look back. I was gasping and wheezing, crying so hard, and 
screaming for my dad. I felt shivers run down my neck and then switched off. I just ran. I even dropped my bag and only realized I didn't have it anymore when I was in the car. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Things no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and that damn bell. I finally heard my dad shout out my name and I knew he was coming my way and that he could see me because of the annotation of his voice. I pretty much lunged myself at him when we got to each other. My dad heard the bell too. My mom could hear it on the phone. She was waiting with the car, ready to leave as fast as we fucking could. I've debated posting this for a while, mainly because I'm not a writer. It's a long story. Apologies in advance for the length. And I don't want to mess it up. So, here I go. This happened to me and my friend Sam three winters ago. We liked exploring nature and walking around outside. And our friends had recently introduced us to this beautiful place in Wisconsin. Grant Park for anyone familiar with the southeastern Wisconsin parks that we had visited with them three or four times before. Every time we had gone with them, it had been a pleasant trip. We walked around, got to see some beautiful views of Lake Michigan, sat in crooks of trees and talked about books and games and other things. We had been starting a new game of Hunter, The Darkness. It was a tabletop RPG game like Dungeons and Dragons. And we were using the park for scenic inspiration. It was great. For the purpose of storytelling, she and I are both five foot two, five foot three females. The first time she and I went alone, we went around dusk to take some pictures that we could Photoshop for the game. This park is massive and there are many bridges, footpaths, and winding roads throughout. We were walking over a bridge that sat against one of the roads with dense woods on either side. As we were crossing, a car drives by and rows down the window and some guy leans out and yells, Hey! at us. We were both startled and jumped, but dismissed him and continued walking towards the bridge. Less than a minute later, the same car comes back driving the other direction, and this time, the driver's side window rolls down, and the driver, another male, calls out, Hey ladies, come here. We picked up our pace, the car drives away, and right as we're about to hit the end of the bridge, we see the car comes by us again from the original direction. We then booked it up into the trees, up the hill, and we hear the car stop and the two men start yelling for us. We continued running and hid in the dark for 15 or so minutes until they left, and we ran back to our car and left. You would think we would avoid the park after that, but once we had gotten out there and properly warmed over a hot chocolate from Perkins, we had a good laugh over having been so scared. We went back to the dark with our male friends a few times, and nothing even remotely scary had happened. So she and I decided to go back, just the two of us, again. Sam and I often spent our afternoons and early evenings exploring the outside, hiking, geocaching, just sitting outside in the parks and talking. So we had just decided to add it to our repertoire. We headed back around dusk again and with a camera to take more pictures, especially since we hadn't gotten the shots we had wanted the first time. Now, obviously, Looking back on this, we both feel incredibly foolish having gone back alone and around the same time and at the same place, but 
As I've said, we had gone a few more times with our male friends, and even when we had just one male with us, nothing had happened. So, we thought we were just being skittish. Anyways, we went back and were about to walk over the same bridge when a car rolls by and, as you guessed it, the window rolls down and some guy just yells out some random noise. This time, we don't wait for them to drive around. We duck into the woods and start walking back towards the pier. We figured we'd abandon the other photo spot and just ignore the pier, take some lake shots. Not really what we were looking for, but we figured if we made it in time for the sunset, which was almost all the way down, we could take some nice pictures over the lake just for fun. The way that that pier is set up is that there was a long, thin road from the top of the giant grass hill down and around a curve and into the parking lot. The pier is at the end of the right side of that parking lot, about 200 yards away. If you walked from near the pier down to the right side of the parking lot, there was a little bridge that led into a development with a tennis court that sat next to the preserve. So, we begin walking down the road to the lake, when the same car from before drives down into the parking lot by the pier. They didn't say anything as they drove past, but we still decided to slow down and decide whether or not we wanted to continue down by the pier. The car turned around in the parking lot and came back up the road. The car reached where we were and stopped. So we immediately turned and started walking down the hill. All of the windows rolled down, and we saw that there were four guys and one girl in the car. They yelled, Hello! And Sam and I turned and waved. One of them then said, Oh, hey, you're cute. And the others joined in. Hey, yeah, wait for us. Now, mind you, we are two small females, but... We were also super bundled up in large winter coats and hats. You could barely see any of our faces or our shapes, so they didn't really have a lot to base it on. We've been ignoring them, and we hear someone yell, We're coming back for you, as they start driving up the hill. Sam and I decided not to take any chances and started running down the hill. We hear hooting and hollering, and see them disappear over the top of the hill. We started running toward the bridge. It was the closest. And once you've gotten over the bridge to the left, there was a concrete deck with a drop-off to a ramp about five feet tall, so that if you got off the bridge and jumped down right away, you'd be at the bottom of the ramp and couldn't be seen from the other side if you ducked down, which is exactly what we did. We hear the car speed back down the hill, and four doors open and close as they all start screaming and laughing. Come here, girls. We'll be nice. We just want to play. Some of them took off to the pier, but two of them stayed behind, and we could make our bits and pieces of what they were saying. Where do you think they went? I don't know. We'll find them, etc. Sam and I are huddled together and freaked out, and once it had been silent near the bridge for a while, we decided to peek out to see if the other two had also left, so we could sneak back up the hill or make a break for it somewhere else. We peek over, and there's a guy on the other end of the bridge, and he clearly sees us. Over here, he screams to his buddies, and starts running across the bridge directly at us, we take off toward the development, running around the side of the tennis court, while being chased by three of the guys. Only one of them is very close to us, about 30 feet, but the rest were catching up faster than we could have liked. We took a quick turn between two houses in the subdivision, and we luckily never saw them from that point on. We got back to our car by walking through the forest preserve incredibly slowly, dashing across roads, terrified out of our minds. We left that night and called our friends we normally went to the preserve with. From then on out, 
They insisted on accompanying us any time we went there. So, creepy-ass guys in the car in the forest preserve. I hope I never run into you again. Over the years, I've been waiting to share this story. This is one that I have been saving for whatever reason, and I think I am ready to share it now. It's a long read, but I believe it's worth it. I grew up in the South, tons and tons of beautiful places to see that haven't been taken over by concrete yet. It's nice, but along with that, it's pretty boring. Being a teenager and wanting to go out and have fun led to mostly improvising with our buddies and hoping something good will come out of the night. There wasn't really a local spot to go hang out, like a club or a cool bar. And the places that were close to this was boring because you did them so many times. I'm sure if you'd ever lived in a rural area, you can understand that feeling completely. Something that I found a ton of enjoyment in as a teen was cruising around super late at night listening to music. I would fill my gas tank up, grab something to drink on, a cigarillo, and I would just take off driving around until the sun came up. It was a way for me to clear my mind and relax. Those country back roads were always fun to drive down at 2 a.m., and it was also just the right amount of spooky. Well, one night, I absolutely got more than what I bargained for. I can't remember what month it was exactly, but I know for a fact it was in the summertime, because I was out of school and I just remember it being a comfortable chill night. So if I had to guess, it must have been around July or August. I was cruising around like I always did and was completely worry-free. I had music blaring and I was in my zone. I decided to head down to a park just out of boredom. This particular park is at the very end of a long stretch of desolate country road, but it is a really nice, pretty drive because of that. When I say desolate country road, I don't mean that it's some dirt road that goes through the woods or anything crazy like that. It is a normal paved road, but there is really nothing on it after a certain point. The entire road takes about 20 miles to drive down to get to the park. And after about 10 minutes into the drive, the houses start to get spread out further and further to becoming no houses and just road leading into the park. I think a lot of the reason I like this drive at night is because of how creepy it was, and I looked at it as some sort of adventure or whatever. The park isn't open for camping or anything. It's mostly just a lot of land with walking trails and biking trails step up through the miles of woods. So obviously at around 3 a.m. in the morning, it's pretty dead. I made it there and just did a slow, normal little loop around drive of the park. The night before it stormed very badly, so badly, I remember my parents and I had to take shelter because of the threat of a tornado touchdown. There ended up being no tornado, but the storms were pretty damn rough. Because of this, I came up on a fallen tree in the road that looped around to the exit of the park. That must have happened because of the storm. It wasn't some massive tree or anything of the sort, but I know for a fact that there was no way I could have gotten over that tree in my car, obviously. It was pitch black everywhere besides the front of my car because of my headlights. And because of that, I immediately ruled out backing up the entire way. I just drove when I entered the park. I knew that was super dangerous and there was no way. At this spot on the road, there was flat land on each side of me. I figured that it would make more sense to just back up in the grass beside me just a little and then drive back the way I came. 
it was a one-way loop around the park, but I wasn't really worried about going the wrong way since it was so late. So I started to back up off the road so I could get my car turned around. All was good until I went to pull back up on the road. I totally didn't take into account how wet the grass was and the amount of mud. My car went absolutely nowhere. My back tires were completely stuck and were spinning in place as I was trying to floor the gas pedal. I started to become pretty scared at this point. Not the most ideal situation to be in. I immediately take my cell phone out of my pocket and saw that I had service. Super huge feeling of relief. I called my parents and told them what had happened and where I was. They were pretty pissed at me, but said they will pay for a tow truck to come and get me out. My parents both drive small four-door sedans, and they would have been zero help in the situation. I was about 45 minutes away from my house and the rest of most human civilization. So, I realized that I would be stuck out there for at least an hour before someone was able to get to me. It's a freaky feeling, but I tried getting out of my head and just continued to listen to music and be on the phone in my car while I waited. Not really much more I could do. After I kind of calmed down from the initial anger I had, I started to check out my surroundings. I didn't even notice at first because of everything going on, but in front of my car's placement was a field that was full of the most amount of deer I think I have ever seen at once. There legitimately must have been 40 deer in this field, just walking around and eating grass. The field wasn't directly in front of my car, but if I was to get out and throw a rock in that direction, I would have been able to easily hit one of them. So if I was to guess, they were about 30 yards out. This didn't really help with the creepy level going on. I'm literally just lost here in the middle of nowhere. Looking out in front of your car and seeing 80 eye reflections staring back at you is a bit of an alarming feeling overall. But I was relieved it was just a field of deer. I watched them for a little bit, but I was quickly over it and started to just browse through my social media apps while waiting. They seemed to have been over it quicker than I was because they all went back to walking around and eating once they figured out that I wasn't going to attack them or anything. After browsing on my phone for about 15 minutes, I finally get a call back from my parents letting me know that a tow truck guy is on the way and about an hour and a half out of my location. Still to this day, I remember hearing that and having the thought you have got to be fucking kidding me. I understood that me and only me was the reason I was in the situation I was in, so I couldn't really be mad at anybody else but me. But that was very obviously not what I wanted to hear. I decided that the smartest thing for me to do was just make sure my doors were all locked, lay back in my seat, and take a nap to try and pass the time quick. So that's what I did. Okay, here we go. So, I wake up 45 minutes later to the feeling of being watched. I'm not sure if anyone has ever experienced that feeling before because I don't know how common it is. But, there was a sixth sense alarm going off in my head telling me that I needed to wake up. Waking up to that feeling in the situation I was in and the surrounding I was in is probably the worst case scenario. I sit up and immediately check my surroundings and see nothing. I looked through my car very quickly for any sort of weapon and found a pocket knife. A fucking pocket knife. I was still very scared. Even though I saw and heard absolutely nothing, that feeling is terrifying. I was shocked to see that the field of deer in front of me was still full of deer. I don't know anything about of animals, but 
I guess I always just assume that they don't hang out in the same place for too long. Not sure why I thought that, but I was surprised to see them nonetheless. I called my parents back to see if they had heard any kind of update from the tow truck dude. I decided to not mention the feeling I was having because I didn't want them to worry more, and I also knew that it was literally nothing more than a feeling I had, and had nothing to back up why I was feeling that way, other than just being spooked out in general. No update from the tow truck guy. So, we all assumed everything was still the same on his end. The call lasted just a few minutes because I felt like such a dick. They both had to wake up for work in a few hours, and now have to spend a random hundred plus dollars, and on top of all of that, they are worried about me. I could tell they were annoyed, at the situation, but worried. I told them I'll make sure to tell them when the guy arrives, and I'm very sorry. We hung up, and I looked up from the phone, and immediately went from zero to 100 in panic mode. The deer in front of me were all completely perked up, staring in the same direction right of them. Let me remind you that there are around 40 deer in this field. Every single one of them were stopped dead in their tracks standing completely still looking at something i put my high beams on and stared waiting for absolutely anything to happen at all nothing i tapped my horn real quick they didn't even budge or look my way they were still completely glued to what was by them the way the tree line was, I couldn't see that far over into the field. I know they were looking into the woods by them, but where I was at, I was only able to see just them. I could hear my heartbeat. I grabbed that stupid fucking pocket knife and just waited for something to happen. I would say it was about a minute after I honked. Every single one of them, in unison, started to run the opposite way. They were running at full speed, and within 20 seconds, the field was completely empty. I was petrified in fear. I knew that staying in my car is what would be the safest thing to do, but it's the worst feeling in the world when you feel like a sitting duck. My head was on a swivel. I was freaking out in every possible way. I assumed that it was a bear or something, but... It could have been absolutely anything. I was convinced at that point it was the devil himself. I didn't know what to do. I knew that the tow truck was close by, but I had no idea where he was. I began to shake because of nerves and just looked around to make sure nothing was by me and focusing on the field in front of me. I did this for what felt like an actual eternity. Sitting in complete silence and darkness in the middle of nowhere, feeling lost, waiting for something to jump out and attack you. Fifteen of the longest fucking minutes of my life go by, and I start to see light break through the tree line on the road. As it gets closer, I see it is the tow truck driver. The lights on his truck felt like it was Jesus coming from heaven to rescue me. He gets up to me, and I jump out of my car, and immediately ask him if he has a gun on me. I told him very quickly what just happened to me, and that something is definitely out here nearby for something. He let me know that he had a shotgun in the truck, and assured me that I was most likely hearing or sensing a bear or bobcat. He gave me the whole, they are more scared of you than you are of them, bullshit. The tree was small enough for him to sort of bulldoze it out of the way with his truck, and then he attached my car to his and pulled me out of the spot I was stuck in. He was very nonchalant about what I just experienced, but I was pretty shaken up badly from it. The whole time he was doing his thing, I still had my eyes glued out in the field, waiting for something. He was completely done with everything in about 15 minutes, and he told me to follow his truck 
out of there onto the main road again. I got into my car and was ready more than anything to get the hell out of this fucking park. We started to drive away from the spot I was in, and I still had my head on a swivel, completely shook up. As we are driving away, I look in my rear view mirror. I looked into my rear view mirror. We were down the park road just a tiny bit, but I could still see the spot I was stuck in partially lit up from the vehicle's lights and the moon. I watched in my rear view mirror as a man came out of the tree line behind where my car was and walked into the middle of the road and watched us drive away. My heart stopped beating. Legitimately, I lost my breath and my eyes started to get full of tears because of how absolutely scared I was in this moment. I couldn't see any sort of details like what he looked like or even necessarily what he was wearing. To be honest, I don't really give a fuck. The feeling that I felt driving away from that spot, knowing he was right there the whole time watching me. Watching me as I was freaking out, looking around. Watching me as I was completely alone for the longest of time. Maybe even coming right up to my window and watched me as I slept. That's a feeling that is something I can't necessarily put into words all these years later and it still messes with me quite a bit the entire time we were driving off as long as i could still see him he didn't move he just watched us in the road a million things went through my mind i was scared they may have been multiple people up the road waiting for us i was trying to figure out if i should start beeping my horn like crazy to get the tow truck guy to stop or not i decided that all i wanted to do was get the fuck out of there more than anything the second that we finally got out of the park and i was able to be on a two-lane road again i flew past that tow truck driver and i did nothing below 70 miles per hour the entire way home i flew through stop signs and stop lights I absolutely did not give a fuck. The only thing on my mind was making it home. I got home, ran inside, very quickly, acknowledged my parents, and said sorry and thank you, and then went into my room. I didn't get a single second of sleep the rest of the night. I was searching for any sort of records of things happening in that area, escaped convicts, similar stories, etc. I came to the conclusion that the man was some sort of squatter or maybe homeless. I read many things online how it's common for homeless people in rural areas to build shelter in the woods, which does make sense to me entirely on why they would do that. But obviously, the unknown is the scariest part of it all. What if he wasn't homeless? What if he was going to hurt me? What if, what if, what if? There's so many possibilities of what could have happened, but the outcome that did happen is what I am most grateful for. I never told my parents this story until many years after it happened, and I was already an adult and moved out. It freaked them the fuck out too when I told them. I never went back to the park, ever. Even though I no longer live by there, I still have no desire at all to ever go back there. I don't think I could even in broad daylight with a ton of people around. I also made the decision to stop doing those late night cruises. I did a few after that time with people, but even then I felt very uncomfortable and on edge. So. To the man whose intentions I did not understand. You scared the fuck out of me. And I hope to never ever run into you again. And this brings a close to these 
true lost in the woods stories. Before I move on, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elliott, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Samantha Blake, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klemko, Anita B, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Les Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lovers, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for continuing to remain the pillars on which this channel sits. And to the other subscribers and listeners, thank you all so much for supporting Back to Ashes. Without you, I would have no voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please stay safe out there and always stay vigilant. I'll be reading to you soon. I hope that everyone has a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.